now at this fourth section, which is called Dirty Language. And one of the things that um, you sort of can expect from a war story is that, or from, we sort of expect from veterans in general, is that um, <laughs> they are going to, they're going to swear a lot. <laughs> and uh, actually they don't necessarily. Um, veterans together, soldiers together, may be some of the most, <laughs> uh, what would Calvin and Hobbes say? P potty mouth and Hobbes would say, oh, potty mouth, potty mouth. You know, some of the most potty mouth characters that you've ever met. Um, but when they're in public with, the, with civilians, they're often very polite. And there's very much a sort of civilian face, uh, pub public, it is public face, private face, soldiers with soldiers, soldiers with civilians. This notion of dirty language then is, it's like, what do we consider to be dirty? Because generally we consider sort of the, the big the big bad words to be the, the you know, the, the sort of we know what they are. They're, oh, they don't say those, you know. And you're trained early not to say them. Well, let me quote to you here from uh, William Eastlake, who was a World War II veteran, um, who wrote a really fine book called Castle Keep. I, I can't recommend this thing enough. It's, it's also a postmodern text. Okay, so Eastlake um, writes in one of his books of poetry, Fuck you is rude, but death is dirty. And this uh, is an agree something that, that O'Brien agrees with um, some two wars, two American wars later. He says on page 66, you can tell a true war story if it embarrasses you. If you don't care for obscenity, if you don't care for the truth. If you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. Send guys to war, they come home talking dirty. As, as they say, 66. Now, the definition of dirty and true here obviously come in for a discussion because what is dirty language fuck you is really not that bad i mean it's it's not as bad as something like covid will go away it'll disappear on its own one day um everybody should go out and you know have big parties and uh, get together and um masks are bad for you which one of these is truly dirty one as he says as eastlake says is rude fuck you we don't say that in polite company you don't you don't go to a you know meal with the in-laws at the christmas table and say well i just want to raise a toast to everybody and say fuck you you know you probably don't do that <laughs> unless you have a very interesting family i <laughs> i would be interested <laughs> to hear about your family um if that's the way things go but if you tell people something and you're getting them killed because of it, because you're being dirty, then that's something else entirely. So what is obscenity? You know, is an obscenity something that is um, pictures of genitals? Um, that's it? I mean, something that everybody has of some version of? Like, that's what we're supposed to be offended by? Really? That's the <laughs> that's the worst thing you've got to show us? It must be something else, right? So what is it that embarrasses you? It's like, okay, you know, if you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. In other words, obscenity should be the thing that you can't look at. You cannot look at it. It's too hard. It's too bad. And when you don't look at it, then you're not looking at the truth because what is obscene is probably also true. There's some element of reality to it that you're like oh god you know i i, I can't look at that Ugh. and if you don't care for the truth then as he says watch how you vote now we have the clearest possible example in front of us at the moment of what happens if you don't care for the truth or if your truth I mean, people talk about you know speaking their truth it's like god what a nightmare it's pure orwellian stuff um, if their truth is, you know, God will protect me. And even if I die in God, you know, I'm always saved in God. It's like, oh, okay, that's your version of reality. But I would say not their truth, but their version. Um, but if you do break down this wall, essentially between what is true and what is obscene, and you try, you sort of try to avoid the two of them because basically as, as, as far as O'Brien is concerned, obscenity and truth are together. 
you know they these are these are one thing if you're gonna get at this you have to get at that okay so in war dirty talk is never is as bad as death so what somebody swore big deal like that's what you got a problem with there's this wonderful moment in uh, a book by linda van uh called home before morning which some of you have have read where she's she's been a nurse for a year in vietnam and she comes home thoroughly burned over by this awful experience and uh, she's sitting with her Parent, her family at the table. She's 23, I guess. And she says, she says, please pass the fucking salt. And they're like, ah, that's it. It freaks them all out. It's like, she's just been at war for a year. And the thing they're upset about is the fact that she says fucking. It's like, well, you know, they should be upset about the fact that her life is going to be blown open by this. Uh, that's the real upset. But uh, no. So uh, language is something we use as a tool to cover over deeply unpleasant realities that we would rather not confront, right? So uh, it's a buffer, it's a medium, it's something we can use to put between the thing we do, that we just can't, we just don't want to face it. We can face it, we just don't want to. And us, you know, where our self is and keep us protected, dry, you know, warm and dry and safe, as opposed to, you know, wet and dangerous and ugly, right? passed on we say for instance people say then someone so passed i'm like oh uh, were they playing football so then they passed okay so who got the ball it's like no 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 they they passed i'm like they they went past me on the highway it's like no 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 they they passed can you not say the word dead is it not within our ability to say the word dead to accept that the body is finished this is something that happens to all of us it's it, like, can we not accept that? No, we can't. Because how many people, I, I keep hearing this, you know, they, I, I meet a few people who say, and then they died. And I'm like, okay, yeah, right. You know exactly what happened, but they passed. They aren't necessarily religious too. If you're, if you're using the word pass, because you mean they move from one state to another, which is some kind of philosophical state or spiritual state where they, you know, they became, uh, they were raised by God into heaven and you, you know, okay, fine. If that's the story you believe, that's the story you believe. Fine. Um, I don't agree, but that's fine. But um, if you're not religious, why would you use a word like pass? Because you want to cover this up. It's a deeply upsetting, frightening thing, which is, which frightens our ontological substance. That is, it frightens, who, you know, who we are at an existential level. It frightens our very existence. So dead is very final. And O'Brien points to this on uh, page 19. He says, there were actors. When somebody died, it wasn't quite dying because in a curious way, it seemed scripted and because they'd had their lines mostly memorized, irony mixed with tragedy, and because they called it by other names as if to insist it or destroy the reality of death itself. So insisting something, you know, putting something uh, we assist forms are in the body around something which the body considers to be poisonous. And so basically it puts a casing of, of skin around it and says, well, that's it, you know, we're going to wall that off. Well, language can be used the same way. They were afraid of dying, he says on page 19, but even more afraid to show it. They found jokes to tell. They used a hard vocabulary to contain terrible softness, greased, they'd say, oft, lit up, zapped while zipping. So this is page 19. This is one of the things that you'll see in, say, um, films about uh, assassination where the hero is an assassin. In other words, good at killing people. Like, what's your major skill? Good at killing people. And we're like, yeah, hey, great, you know, bring it on. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Uh, hey, that's that's fun. That's a fun narrative. And it is fun, except that we don't say that they kill people. We say, oh, so-and-so got greased, waxed, zapped. Like, what? You mean they got killed? They were dead now. That's it. So the language basically is soft, to, to handle this kind of, of softness. You know, the language itself uh, becomes a tool. Um, the dead body that's been spilled open basically by the terrible qualities of industrial warfare. Um, I learned, he says on 226, that words would make a difference. It's easier to cope with a kick bucket than a corpse. If it isn't human, it doesn't matter much if it's dead, right? And so you say, oh, what happened? This is 226. Say, oh, what happened to them? It's like, oh, they kicked the bucket. It's like, oh, no problem. Okay, that's all right. Kick the bucket. I can handle that.